Hey guys, let's have another uh, quick video on uh, earth systems. We're going to talk specifically in this case about soil formation. How do we get from the rocks in the rock cycle that obviously come from the uh, crust and the tectonic plates? How do we get from all that to the soil that obviously is going to have a pretty much direct impact on, on human and all really biological life? So essentially what soil is, is soil is a mix of geologic and organic components. So you've got parts of the biosphere here um, that as they die and decay, they get deposited. Um, and of course they're manure and stuff like that. And then you've got parts of the geosphere, which are the rocks being broken down. You need both of these things together um, to actually make soil. So like if you just have sand, things don't grow well in sand. That's just the rock component. And so for it to actually become soil and to grow, you've got to mix in organic matter with that. And that's why if you've got really sandy soil, that it's usually necessary to either mix in some fertilizer or some manure or some compost or something that gives it some organic components. And that's really what compost is, is compost is organic components that are going to decay down. And then if you mix those in with the rock components, some dirt, some clay, some stuff like that, then it can become actual soil. So two parts here, you get the breakdown of the rocks, you got deposition of organic matter, those two things together are gonna to create soil. So we talked about the breakdown of the rocks in the rock cycle uh, video that we did before this. Um, the deposition of organic matter again is um, as things die and are broken down by bacteria, uh, stirred up by earthworms, stuff like that, um, manure being deposited, all of those things are going to go into making proper soil as well. And there are basically five factors that are going to affect what the soil is like. And, and we all know that different kinds of soil are going to be used in, are going to be appear in different areas and are going to be used to grow different things. So the first thing is the parent material. So what kind of rock um, is actually being broken down? And so it, it's a little hard to see in the video here, but this top example, this is some uh, granite. Um, and if that's broken down, you tend to not really get super rich soils because granite has a lot of silica components in it, which is think about sand. Um, and so it's not going to be very nutrient rich just from the rock component. Now, of course, if you add organic component to it, that's what makes it soil and that's what helps out. But on the other hand, if something like, say, limestone breaks down, limestone is, is essentially calcium. Um, and so the calcium that's in that um, is going to actually be one of the active nutrient components in the soil. And so the parent material, what kind of rock breaks down to actually form the rock component, um, is pretty important to what the soil is. Um, climate obviously has a pretty big effect on this. Um, the temperature and precipitation particularly are going to affect how quickly the soil forms. Um, soil is not going to form very well typically in really uh, cold climates. Um, but in warmer climates, and particularly in climates where um, you get a lot of precipitation, therefore a lot of weathering, a lot of erosion, um, a lot of deposition uh, from that pre pre precipitation, then the soil is going to form much more quickly. And that's why in um, tropical areas you tend to see much richer types of soils and in temperate regions obviously as, com as compared to say Arctic regions, you're gonna get much better soil out of that. Um, the third thing that is gonna affect the rate or uh, affect the soil formation is topography. In other words, how steep is the land? Um, it tends to be just generally speaking that the steeper the slope, that the more quickly it's going to erode because this higher up it is, the steeper it is, um, the faster the water's gonna flow down it, the more it's probably gonna be subjected to wind. All of those things are gonna weather and break down the rock and then lead to quicker soil formation. Uh, what kind of organisms are in the area? And so again, this works against Arctic regions because there's not quite the vast variety of organisms. Um, and so plants and animals are going to take nutrients out of the soil. Uh, bacteria and stuff are going to break stuff down. Earthworms are going to help to mix up the soil. And so all of those things together um, are the organisms, the biological part that's going to help to start to make up the soil. And the fifth component um, is time. Okay, So the longer the time goes on, in general, the more what we call mature the soil. Now, the reason that we call it more mature soil is A, the particles of the rock are usually broken down much finer. And then secondly, there's gonna to tend to be a lot more organic material there. So like for instance, if we were talking about like a volcanic island that just formed, um, some of the rock might be a little bit broken down. So if we we're talking about like a volcanic island that had just formed, um, some of the rock might break down, but until animals start to come there, um, and you might get birds and stuff like that obviously coming by, but you're not going to have a lot of organic matter, so it's going to be a very immature soil. As time goes on and that volcanic isle um, ages a little bit, the rocks break down a little bit more. More plant life starts to come in, seeds get dropped by birds, stuff starts to grow, break down the soil more. It dies off and forms more organic material, and then as time goes on, you get a much more mature soil out of that. 
Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the layers in soil. Um, layers in soil are called soil horizons. Don't let that term like sort of throw you off. Horizon means layer for us. Um, and so we've got some basic layers here. So we've got an organic um, layer at the top, which basically just means that the very top layer of the soil is essentially just the plant life typically. Um, uh, especially in a forest or grassland, that's what's going on at the very top is you've basically got a little bit of dirt mixed in with mostly organic material um, in the form of actual living organisms. Right under that is the really important area for us. And you see here in the diagram from about two inches to 10 inches down, of course, that varies very drastically depending on where you are, what type of climate, what type of soil you have. But that's the topsoil layer. Um, and that's where everything is really well mixed together. You've got a really nice blend of the mineral components, the rock components, and of the organic components to supply the nutrients. And so you've got a firm base to hold everything there, and then you've got a lot of nutrients there that can be pulled up. Um, in areas where the topsoil isn't there, that's why we have to add that in. Um, if there's not a good a mix of organic materials, or if, or if maybe if the, uh, uh, the actual soil itself maybe can't, uh, isn't very porous and doesn't let a lot of water in, then we might have to add some soil to the top to be able to properly grow things there. It's okay, so that's that A layer, that's the top soil layer. Underneath that, we've got a couple of subsoil layers. Now you see here in the B subsoil layer, we've still got some root formations going through, um, but there's not really a whole lot of organic material. Usually those root systems that are gonna go deep down, usually what they're pulling up is more water. Um, there is some nutrients there, but not a whole lot. Um, sort of depends on, again, what, what area you're in um, and, and what they're trying to pull out of there. And then as we get down to level C, you'll see that there's not really any plant action going on here. Um, you're almost to the bedrock area. Um, there's just not, the, the rocks aren't broken up enough to even allow for any real mixing. And there's no plant life or animal life going on there to be able to actually mix everything up and make the soil rich enough to help to grow things. Um, one thing that I didn't put here in the notes is that right in between um, the A and the B layer is sometimes what's called an E layer. Um, if you're in a very acid soil, you can usually get an acid layer right there. Um, that is usually very distinguishable. Um, and typically speaking, we don't really want uh, acidic soils. So the physical properties of the soil, in other words, uh, this essentially means what are the size of the rock particles. So we've uh, got three main categories. We've got sand and silt and clay. Sand particles tend to be really big, okay? And, and you'll see here, this is a sand particle and so is this. So um, the, the sand has a really wide variance. You can have kind of big particles and then much smaller particles. Anything bigger than about two millimeters though isn't really sand anymore. It's more like gravel um, than it is sand. And you still have some of those particles around occasionally, but it doesn't really make for very good soil most of the time. Um, smaller particles than sand are called silt. Um, the way I always think about that is, is if you like step in the bottom of a, a river usually and you get sort of that uh, muddy, sort of slick feeling uh, soil, a lot of times that's silt. Um, now, of course, in Tennessee, what that is actually probably more likely to be is clay, and that's sort of the vast bulk of our soil around here. Um, and that essentially means that everything is, is ground down really fine. Now, one of the reasons why we have so much clay here is that the mountain system that surrounds us um, is a very old mountain system, and so it's been eroded a lot. And so the rock particles have had time to break down into these really, really small and fine particles that form the clay that is pretty much in every river system and makes up all the soil around us. You know, if you, it's not just the UT logo. If you dig down in the soil, Tennessee pretty much does bleed orange. Um, it's pretty much clay all the way um, through. Um, this triangle is called a soil triangle. And essentially what this allows you to do is it allows you to determine the type of soil, not just that it's clay, silt, or sand, but knowing the percent of clay, silt, and sand allows you to actually say, this is this kind of soil. So this is a loamy soil, or this is a sand or silt, or it's silty clay loam, or sandy clay, or whatever those things are. It all depends on what the percentage is. So for instance, you would basically read this thing um, in multiple directions. And so if I had say 40% um, clay and 10% silt, okay, and then um, that would obviously leave another 50% in that sand. So I'd come up in the 50 and sand, I'd hit the 40 from the clay, and then I'd hit the 10 from the silt, and so I'd be right here in this area, and so that would be a sandy clay. Um, we're gonna do some actual labs where you're gonna determine what type of soil is in a specific area that we're gonna take a sample of. Now, of course, we're in Tennessee, chances are probably pretty likely to be somewhere up here in the top part in the clay region, silty or sandy clay or some clay loam or something like that. Um, a couple other characteristics about soil that are important for us is the porosity. The porosity depends essentially on what type of particles do you have. 
Um, and what porosity means is how quickly does this does uh, water, um, or really any liquid, but water in particular, drain through the soil. And the way it works is that since sand has much bigger particles, then there are bigger spaces between the particles because the particles can't fit as tightly together. Think about if you had some like basketballs and you were trying to you know put them together, you'd have these big gaps between them. But if you took like golf balls and put them together, you'd still have gaps, but they'd be much smaller gaps because the circumference and the radius of the uh, particle overall would be much smaller. And that's exactly what's going on here in the sand and the silt and the clay is the smaller the particles, the less porous it is. So for instance, when we did our filtering thing, if you pour, when you poured water in, it essentially went right through the sand if you poured it directly in. You had to sort of move it around or it would just go right through and not filter very well at all. Silt, it's going to take a little bit longer to get through. And then clay, if you've got a pack of, you know, especially densely packed clay, um, really it, it pretty much blocks water altogether. Water can, I mean, it might take it 100 years or so to actually get through that clay because the particles are so tightly packed together. This is why a lot of times when they want to uh, sort of contain some hazardous waste, they'll put some clay areas over it and then some plastic over it because even if some liquid gets through the plastic, then it actually has a long time and it's really difficult to get through the clay because it's not very porous. Um, another important characteristic of soils is uh, the cation exchange capacity, and we'll talk um, more about the actual implications of this when we do agriculture later in the year. Um, but essentially, this just means how, how well does the soil grab onto ions? Um, and, and by ions, we mean like, you know, uh, metal cations, so things like calcium and potassium, magnesium. These are all important nutrients that the soil needs um, to supply to the biomass. And so if it has a high cation exchange capacity, that's good because that means that it can absorb, uh, I'm sorry, adsorb um, a lot of cations to it. Um, the word adsorb means that it's actually going to hold it on the outside. Absorb with a B means that it would pull it into it much like a sponge would. Um, and so in general, this is really good. Now, this can be bad because if you notice down here, sodium is one of our cations too. And most soils don't do very well with sodium at all. Um, plants don't tend to grow very well in sodium, except for a few um, things that are called halophiles um, that actually do grow relatively well in salt um, areas. And, and they're actually being used to remediate some really rough patches uh, like in Australia and stuff like that. Um, our next thing is the base saturation. Uh, remember that base essentially is the opposite of acid. And so essentially what base saturation means is how many bases are in the soil compared to the acids. In general, this is a broad generalization, is we want bases and not acids in most of the soil because it tends to be most of our nutrients are bases. Most of the acids tend to be um, heavy metals and, and things that are going to lower the pH and make it so that organisms can't leave, uh, live there. So we really want more base saturation. So in general, if you've got a high cation exchange capacity and a high base saturation, that's usually going to mean that your soil is a lot healthier. It's going to be much more conducive to growing living organisms. And of course, we've got the biological properties of the soil. So, um, you know, how much um, living biomass is in there? So there's biomass that is dead biomass that's been decomposed, but the living organisms are important too. Perhaps the most important thing for us on this planet is that we need that nitrogen-fixing bacteria, okay? We've got to have some way to pull the nitrogen out of the air. Remember the nitrogen cycle. We've got to have some way to pull that nitrogen out of the air and get it into the soil in a form like nitrates that the plants can actually absorb and use as nutrients to make their amino acids and proteins. Um, those organisms that are in the biological organisms in the soil are also going to act to mix up the soil. And then, of course, they're going to, um, you've got detritivores um, that are going to help to break down that organic matter as well. And again, return those nutrients back to the soil. Um, and finally, there are a lot of different ways that our soil can get degraded. Um, so I, I've got a list here, and, and we'll talk about a lot again as we get into agriculture, but uh, these are pretty important. And so, um, the more that topsoil gets plowed up, the more susceptible it usually is to um, blowing away or the more that it gets plowed up and, and planted on, the more the nutrients are sort of leached out of it, they're, they're depleted. Um, this is why if we look back to uh, like uh, colonial times, one of the great things that uh, the uh, uh, settlers learned from Native Americans was, the, was a little bit of the idea of what the crop rotation that was particularly good um, in American soil, that idea of using um, beans and corn and squash and what that did was that it, each, each of those used a sort of different type of nutrients. The beans in particular helped to fix the bacteria, I'm sorry, fix the nitrogen because they have that nitrogen fixing bacteria in their roots and so that helps to replenish all of the soil. Um, and so what degrades the soil then is if you don't do that, if you don't rotate the crops then the nutrients essentially, if you plant the same crop year after year after year it, it drains all the nutrients out of the soil and so you have to keep fertilizing it over and over again. 
And of course, that has some pretty drastic impacts too. That you start to build up too much of the nutrients, um, too much of the chemicals that you don't need in the soil, and that causes other problems. Um, as vegetation is removed, that obviously is going to that, that vegetation, the root systems help to hold the soil there. And so, even in areas that we don't think that that's as important, like we tend to think of that as like trees and stuff. But as the as grasses die out, or as they get eaten by say sheep or something like that. Um, then their root systems die out and there's nothing there to hold the soil. And this happened a lot in the Midwest um, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, they essentially called the Midwest the Dust Bowl because um, they had a drought and as the grasses died up and their root systems died, there was essentially nothing left there to hold the top soil down. And so these winds that are pretty prevalent in the Midwest essentially came through and blew away billions upon billions of tons of topsoil. Um, another way the soil can be deg degraded is that if it's compacted, what happens is that it, as it gets compacted, it's, it loses its porosity, and so the water can't get through, and so it just sort of sits on the surface and then runs off. And if you're not getting water in the soil, obviously, then nothing's going to be able to grow there. That leads to more drying of the soil. And of course, there's other ways that the soil can be dried as well. Um, but that compacting um, is part of it. If the topsoil is removed, um, as we remove trees and vegetation and stuff like that, all of those things work to essentially break down the soil and make it less useful for supporting life.